I first saw the wild horses about 15 years ago. There used to be quite a large mob running free in my family property in the high country of New South Wales. They were strong and healthy horses, thriving in the rugged mountain country. Then one day, most of the mob disappeared. Ever since the first horse was ridden thousands of years ago, the relationship between man and horse has been a special one. As a horse handler, my life revolves around building partnerships with horses. I have tried all my life to develop that relationship in an attempt to understand the secrets locked inside the horse's mind. It was a long time before I saw any of the wild horses again. Then one day the old stallion and three of his mares returned to their favourite stomping ground. The rest of the mob were nowhere to be seen, but the remaining horses were in good spirits, celebrating life as they came down out of the mountains. They were having a ball and I got a kick out of just watching them. A gorgeous white mare with a matted mane caught my attention. She stood out from the rest of the horses, exploding with enthusiasm and exuberance for life that was just awesome. This little horse was simply enjoying being alive. I can only guess as to what happened to the rest of the wild horses. Brumby Muster is part of Australia's folklore and tradition. Wild horses are often rounded up and sold off for pet food. The best of the best are broken in and put under saddle. Horses are an introduced species in Australia and feral horses are seen as a pest in most parts of the country. Wild horses do need to be controlled but the methods used must be humane. In recent years, the culling of wild horses in Australia's national parks hit front page news as reports of wounded and dying horses became public. Feral horses are not a native Australian animal. When they breed in the wild, their numbers can increase rapidly. Horses' hooves are hard and designed for speed and durability and in large numbers can do real damage to the Australian bush. As I watched the mob, I was fascinated by one horse in particular, the white mare with the matted mane, the same horse that had caught my attention weeks before. She appeared to be in control and I began to realise that she must be the lead mare. She seemed to be in charge of the wild horses, even more so than the stallion. The lead mare defines the pecking order within the mob and is usually the most assertive and spirited member. The reason I was so taken by the lead mare was because in all of my experience with domestic problem horses, I as the horse handler am effectively assuming the role of the lead mare. I communicate using similar body language that the problem horse respects and understands, helping to solve all sorts of issues without physically or mentally harming the horse. Quite often by simply driving the horse away in an assertive manner, which is mimicking the behaviour of the dominant mare dealing with a disrespectful member of her mob, I can establish a new pecking order with myself as a leader and the problem horse as a follower. Once this pecking order has been well and truly defined, the partnership can begin based on mutual respect and understanding. 
I was completely fascinated by the lead mare of the Tindery herd as she demonstrated this kind of behaviour in the wild. The Tindery horses were quite vulnerable out in the bush because nobody owns wild horses in Australia. To some people they may be seen as pests, eating food best kept for sheep and cattle. To me, they are the last great survivors of a bygone era, worthy of respect and admiration. The future of the wild horses in my area was uncertain, and I couldn't bear to think what might happen to them if I left them unprotected out in the scrub. It was then that I began to develop a plan to round up and relocate the remaining wild horses of the Tindery Ranges. extremely tough. The wild horses came down out of the mountain country to graze on a spring flat where there was plenty of feed. It gave me the perfect opportunity to round the horses up and put them through into the safety of the fence paddock. Yeah, take a break off a bit sooner. Yeah, without sort of stuffing the stallion and the other horse up. Stallion's thinking about moving. Feeling a little bit threatened. Come on, take your run. The Palomino and Chestnut horses went through into the fence paddock and the old stallion followed soon after. The lead mare was a different story altogether. She wheeled away, calling to her companions to follow her back to the bush. I was impressed with the way she moved, her solid confirmation and the strength of character she displayed. It was then I decided to call this great little horse, Snowy. Nobody likes to be left out of the group on their own and Snowy was no exception. With a little more convincing, Snowy finally joined the others and I had my wild horses. Mate, that's about the closest we've ever been to him. Right alongside the old stallion. <laughs> Felt like going... <laughs> Great. I went to work with my good mate John Short and began the construction of the round yard and holding pens for the wild horses. We lived out in the bush for about a month and put together a post and rail yard 
in the tradition of the Australian old timers. It was tough going considering we needed 20 posts and 60 rails for the job, but it was well worth the effort. Everything was going along great guns until we discovered a granite boulder in one of our post holes. The only way we were going to move that rock would be to blast it out of the ground. I called in Owen, a mate of mine who reckons he knows a thing or two about explosives. I love working with horses, Owen loves blowing things up. Right, what we've done is we've uh, drilled a hole into the rock, which is uh, probably almost a, a foot deep, and uh, we've put some explosives, some high explosives in that hole. And what it's going to do to the rock is blast the face off it. What I'll do is unravel a piece of fuse, then we'll tape a detonator onto the end and um, light it and walk away. With the rock successfully blasted out of the ground, all that Shorty and I had to do now was finish building the round yard. Oh, just, just for counting, there's what, okay. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 11, 12, 13, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19. We've got 5 done, 5 panels done, and that's 14 to go. Yeah. 14, 14 panels yeah. to go. So. I think we'll be back here for quite a while. We'll be back here for a couple of weeks. All right, let's go. Finish this one. Yeah. A few weeks later and many man hours of hard work, the round yard and holding pens were ready. Everything was in place. My journey with Snowy, one of the last wild horses of the Tindery Ranges, was about to begin. The wild horses settled in well to their new temporary home. Up until now, my main motivation had been to remove the wild horses from the bush to the safety of the family property, Calandon. Now that I had the wild horses in, I became acutely aware of the huge responsibility that I'd assumed. Snowy is a mature, dominant mare who has never felt the touch of a human hand. Deep inside her mind is the greatest learning experience known to any horseman. Snowy could teach me so much as long as the methods that I used in developing a partnership with her were not based on fear and intimidation. I intended to use the same body language that she'd used within the mob. By assuming the position of the leader, I hoped that Snowy would follow. If she was willing to follow me, it was possible that I could take her right through to the saddle without destroying any of the free spirit within her. My ultimate dream was to ride Snowy through the high country as a willing partner. By building a partnership with the lead mare, it would also give me more confidence that when the time came to release the wild horses onto our property, they would be happy to settle in and follow Snowy's lead. The first session was really exciting as Snowy locked onto my body language with real understanding. I was looking for signs of submission respect and trust. She showed these signs by lowering her head, licking her lips and chewing, and tuning in with her ears, focusing on my every move. Snowy had an incredible temperament, an unspoilt willingness to explore the possibilities I presented to her. It was definitely happening. Where'd you get up to yesterday, mate? Um, sort of got her so she just sort of started to lock on a little bit. She had a, uh, a little bit of a habit that was forming where she'd come into a point and then she would 
then she'd start to sort of back up and try and get away from the pressure. I've got her so now she'll sort of lock on, take a few steps forward. So if I start to sort of get her to yield here, there, she starts to sort of, there we go. And she's licking straight away, so she's kind of starting to come towards me instead of always trying to get on the outside of the rail. Yeah, she's relaxing pretty well. Hmm. Yeah, she's licking there straight away. She's dropping the head pretty well. Yep, yep. So uh, hopefully she'll, um, she'll just keep coming forward and she'll stay relaxed and eventually we'll work her into the rope and then we'll you know, get her desensitised to that and uh, she'll be cool. I'll just keep poking around so she, um, she can do a little bit of work. I didn't want that to happen, Shorty. I think we uh, we better get this ground ploughed up or something because uh, she's had a few little slips down here. And, no, uh, no idea. Yeah, no, she. Because um, that one there, she could have bloody. Oh, she could have hurt herself then. I checked Snowy out to make sure she was okay. She seemed fine, but I decided to give her a break for a couple of days just to be on the safe side. Well, I'll go and get the tractor and we'll just uh, get her something to get a purchase on. I ploughed up the round yard to soften the surface, reducing the risk of Snowy slipping over again. As I worked, I began to wonder about Snowy's heritage and history. Her bloodline seemed to indicate a strong heavy horse influence, possibly a throwback to the style of horse replaced by modern day tractors. I could imagine Snowy being a great asset to the old timers working the gold fields of the high country. Although we'll never know for sure, Snowy's history could well be tied to an old ghost town in the backcountry called Cowra Creek, close to my family property, Calandon. Cowra Creek used to be a gold mine in the late 1800s, a bustling little community of about 200 people. It's very much wilderness country now. The wild horses had roamed free in the area for many years. This was definitely the bike to Barry McGowan is a well-known Australian historian who has written books about the lost communities of the Tindery Ranges. Barry was camping at Cowra Creek with my brother Darren and his wife Sarah. Darren was asking Barry about possible gold deposits because some people reckon there's still quite a lot of gold to be found. I was more interested to find out about the history of horses in the area and Barry was definitely the man to ask. Seeing as I was giving Snowy a break for a couple of days, I organised a ride through the back country to Cowra Creek to have a yarn with Barry. I invited some friends of mine to come along for the ride. Shorty, my mate who built the round yard with me, brought his faithful old mare, Millie. Macca and Sharon brought their ex-race horse, Jake. I'd be riding Sam, my Arab endurance horse, so everybody had a horse except for Macca. He's a good horseman, so I thought I'd get him to put some miles on a new horse I'd picked up cheap. This horse had bucked his previous owner off a few times and I'd bought him for a dollar. Macca was keen, so we threw a saddle on. I'll send him out, Macca. A bit fresh, a bit fresh. Week. Too tall for me. <laughs> All the way up there, mate. Hey, Greg. Yeah, mate. Check Sam out here. He's asleep on the post. He's got his bottom lip just got his jaw wedged down on the post. He's like, come on, Dad. I've seen you do all this stuff before. Do something different. Get a wild one.
Macca and my $1 warm blood hit it off famously. And we were all set for our trip out to see Barry and find out more about the history of horses in the area. The ride out to Cowra Creek to catch up with Barry was sheer bliss. The native animals, the remoteness, it's just the best. Seeing the diversity of Australia's native animals out in the bush makes you realise not only how lucky we are, but also why it's essential to have a policy on introduced and feral animals in Australia. Wild horses are an introduced species and they do need to be controlled. They compete with Australia's native animals for food and territory and we need to have a responsible attitude towards all introduced species. There are no easy answers or easy solutions, but that doesn't mean we should quit trying to find that delicate balance. I always like to break up a long ride for the horses and give them a chance to cool down. By letting your horses have a role in the play, it just adds to the enjoyment of getting out here in this great country. The, the horses came from several sources. We're not just talking about what happened in the goldfields period, but bear in mind this area, not necessarily just here, but this general area of the Tindery Ranges was settled many, many years ago. Uh, the, the, the Clark Gang, for example, the, the infamous bush rangers had their hideouts in the Tindery Ranges. They used to uh, steal other people's horses. Uh, the horses were a very valuable commodity. Sure. And when the land didn't pay for the, the small selectors, they would walk off their properties or the banks would resume them or they'd be amalgamated or other properties, the horses would become redundant. Sure. Uh, many horses were free grazed as well and it didn't take much for free grazing horses to join the wild mob. Now you just are moving from an earlier process to a later process when there were more horses free grazing uh, that were owned by gold miners, they would have also linked up with the mobs and it wasn't just a case of them all being released when the goldfield died, I believe it was a continual process sure, over, over many years. years. And then when the goldfield finished, that was the last phase, if you like. Sure. So in your mind, like I've noticed out in the bush here, there's lots of wild goats, wild pigs, and of course wild horses. Yes. Um, it's possible that these animals escaped or were released Absolutely. from the, the remnants of this community. That's my feeling. There is an excellent story, Barry, that comes out of Breadbow about horses in the area. And there was a guy named Charlie McKinney. It was turn of the century stuff, and he was a legend horseman. He used to be able to jump both railway gates at Breadbow when they were closed in one leap. And he didn't ever stop for a gate. He, was, he always jumped the gates. He was just a very, very good horseman. And one evening he was riding back to the Breadbow station, which was a central part of the community there at the time and his horse slipped on the frost and he came off the horse. The horse died and they took Charlie to the Breadbow Hotel which is still there on the side of the highway there. Yes. And back at the hotel he died three or four days later. And the story goes that Australia's famous poet Banjo Patterson who appears on Australia's $10 note was at the Breadbow Hotel at the time of Charlie McKinney's death and shortly after he wrote the classic Australian poem The Man from Snow River. And some people say that Charlie McKinney was indeed the inspiration for Banjo's poem. It's a good story, a bit of local legend.
can see some specks in there. Yeah, and that's what you're looking yeah. for. G'day, g'day, g'day. Hello. There you go. Barry, how are you, mate? Oh, After finding enough gold to barely cover the cost of lunch, Fossa King for the afternoon was abandoned and we headed up with Barry to the ruins of the main township of Carra Creek. I was looking forward to finding out more about the history of horses in the area. And most people here had horses because that was their main form of transport and there were several carrier teams here, particularly in the 1900s when it became obvious that the the ore, the gold, had to be transported out to the railhead of Fredbo. Yep. Then you had two or three carriers resident on the field for a while, yep. and they were definitely horse teams at that stage. This is the way it's shaped. 1900s, yeah. yeah. It's 1890s. 1890s, 1900s, yeah. That's oh, yeah. no doubt about it at all. We spent the rest of the afternoon with Barry, checking out the ruins of the Carra Creek ghost town. The remnants of this once vibrant community are slowly but surely being reclaimed by the rugged Aussie bush. One of the stories Barry told us was about Mrs Murray and her piano, which was carried through the gully, across the creek, and up the hill to the community hall. Four of the strongest men were employed for this job. Families would come from all around to join in on the song and dance evening. You could almost hear the ghostly sounds of the past in the peace and the quiet of that afternoon. Thanks, Barry. Okay, my pleasure. We'll catch my you pleasure, up. Greg. Yep, certainly. Thanks, Greg. Yep. See you, See you later. later. When I got back home, I took a ride to check on the wild horses and was in for a big surprise. That is amazing. I hadn't counted on the old stallion catching the scent of my neighbour's mares quite a distance away. This is the first time we've left the gate unlatched without a secure rope around it and uh, the stallion and the little palomino have shot through. Fortunately, Snowy was separated in the round yard and the chestnut mare chose to stick with her. It turned out that the palomino filly wasn't far away and soon came back to hang out with the companions. But the old stallion had gone bush, which caused me real concern. He already had a reputation for knocking down fences and stealing mares. I hoped the old fella hadn't gone and got himself into trouble. If he was hung up in a fence somewhere, it would take a long time to track him down, and by then it could be too late. I had to find him. By the time I got to the stallion, he'd already reached the fence and was looking pretty worked up. The only thing I could do was to get between him and the mares and hopefully drive him back to the round yard. 
As he pranced around the bush, I manoeuvred Sam into position and stood my ground. He had one of two choices. He could have a go at us to get to the neighbour's mares, or head back to his own mob, waiting for him at the round yard. Fortunately, he decided that the mares next door weren't worth the effort and with some persuasion, he took off back to his own mob. After a feed, he settled down. It was about this time that one of my Arab mares came into season. It was a great opportunity to begin a breeding program with the old stud. He showed off and obviously impressed her with his fancy moves. After getting to know the mare, he successfully bred her. I was keen to introduce the old stallion's tough wild horse bloodlines into my Arab endurance mares. I can't wait till next spring to see whether we end up with our first wild horse cross Arab super endurance horse. I believe that the wild stallion's toughness can only add to the delicate bloodlines of my Arab endurance horses. The old stallion has survived out in the bush for decades without any help whatsoever. And this is a truly remarkable feat. I'm hoping that the wild cross Arab foals will inherit his strength and stamina and become world-class endurance horses. Endurance riding is one of my favourite sports. It combines my great love of the outdoors with the best aspects of horsemanship. You get to camp out under the stars and mix with people who share the same passion for horses. To me, this is the ultimate partnership covering immense distances while staying in tune with your horse's well-being and monitoring any signs of fatigue. The rides are anywhere from 40 kilometres to 160 k's in one day. Uh, vet checks along the way make sure that all horses are in good condition or withdrawn before any damage is done. It's an exciting sport that I share with my purebred Arab, Sam. Eight kilometres done out of 32, and then a following 18 k's after that, Sam's lapping it up. He's barely sweated up. He loved it. Right. Egg. Oh, egg. Great, I just went through a vet check with egg on my face. Lovely. Excellent. <laughs> egg on my face. Yeah, 48 heart rate, and he's coping really good. Very proud of him. After successfully completing the endurance ride, it was all hands on deck for a quick pack up of the campsite. I was keen to get back home and continue working with Snowy. My time with Snowy in the round yard was teaching me so much. Using comfort and discomfort, I assumed the role of lead mare and asked Snowy for her acceptance of this role reversal. Causing discomfort by driving her away to the outside of the round yard, 
I was then able to allow her to find comfort in coming towards me, always looking for signs of understanding and respect. She lowered her head, licked her lips and generally softened. It was time for the rope. I hoped she was ready. I had to be really careful not to allow the rope to become a negative experience. We'd come so far together, and this would certainly test our partnership. I let the rope fly. She read my body language perfectly and quickly accepted the rope as nothing more than an extension of my arm. It was amazing to see how far she'd come when not too long ago, she was stamping her feet and giving me the kind of body language which was quite uncomfortable at times. Having accepted the rope, she was willing to have the halter put on. It was time to get up on her back. By keeping my energy levels up, rather than being sneaky and causing Snowy to become suspicious, I was able to convince her to stand still and allow me to stand by her side. Watching Snowy out in the scrub, I remembered times when her body language was quite aggressive. And although this was just play, I had to be aware that in the round yard, it could turn into a defense mechanism. She was quite reactive at times, but to her credit, she never once lashed out. By allowing her to find comfort when she was willing to stand still and accept me, and causing her to do some work when she refused, it wasn't long before she allowed me up on her back. And that was a very special, very fulfilling moment. It's interesting comparing Snowy's responses to this type of handling with that of a domestic horse. Recently I worked with a beautiful racehorse who wouldn't bury a load reliably. He'd get all worked up and stressed. Using the same methods of comfort and discomfort, I was able to help that horse deal with issues that had caused him to have these problems. By taking time to show that the barrier could become a comfortable place in comparison to a work zone outside the barrier, he submitted eventually and has since raced and I believe doing quite well. Snowy was coming along beautifully. She was relaxed and focused. There was a real bond forming between us, demonstrated by the fact that she would lock onto me whenever I asked her to. In the next sessions, I worked on picking her feet up and continued to develop the trust. I needed Snowy to be looking to me for support and direction. I made sure she was still totally comfortable with me on her back. I was hoping that the foundation work was fully understood and would help her cope with the biggest test so far. It was time for the saddle. Snowy was charged. She knew this was a big step. I secured the girth. It was now completely up to Snowy to come through this, and hopefully, look to me for support.
She came through for me, better than I could have hoped. All of her attention focused on me as she looked to me for guidance and support. I was so proud of her as I went and rubbed her head for a while. It was time for her first ride. I settled into the saddle and asked Snowy to take her first steps forward. She was just about perfect. I think I may have moved a bit too quickly the next day. A term came to mind, the second ride syndrome, where a horse has had some time to think about what happened the day before and may choose to test the partnership. Snowy decided she did not want me to use my right rein, and to put it bluntly, she just said no. She danced around a bit, but she wasn't being too bad. I was getting into a fight with Snowy. And this was the last thing I wanted to do. I decided to dismount and sent Snowy around the yard. I needed to return to the comfort and discomfort groundwork to help Snowy come through this misunderstanding. I worked her around the yard until once again she was looking to me for direction. I allowed her to come back in and she forgave me. I swung back into the saddle and I knew then that my partnership with Snowy, one of the last wild horses of the Tindery Ranges, was complete. The wild horses now run free in the safety of our family property, Calandon. Calandon is 1,000 acres of rugged Australian bushland in the Tindry Ranges of New South Wales. Having the whole property to themselves, the wild horses are very content. Realising my dream of riding Snowy through the bush as a true partner, I'm filled with a sense of anticipation. I hope one day I can help more wild horses in Australia. But right now, I'm happy looking out for the ones in my own backyard. <laughs>